Welcome to episode 345 of the Shared Security Podcast. And today we're going to be talking about probably the worst case of SQL injection I have seen since like 2012, maybe, or maybe even earlier. I don't know, but it also in a very critical and highly used app by none other than the TSA, who we all know and love. So this will be fun. And then we're going to talk about the recent rise in Bitcoin ATM scams targeting older adults. So we'll talk about what you need to know and what to pass on to your older friends and family members. So like G.I. Joe said in the 1980s, knowing is half the battle. And speaking of knowing is half the battle, joining me today is my co-host, Kevin Johnson, a man of the 1980s. A man. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the record, I was born in 1973, so I could see a teenager of the 1980s I can go with. Right? You're a kid of the 80s. Yeah. yeah. Is that better? Oh, yeah. I am man. too. I was a latchkey so, kid. Yes. Yes. Let's, let's never forget that we are Gen X, which is the forgotten generation, by the way. I would argue we're not been forgotten because we keep mentioning it. Reminding people. Yeah, here, here, here we are on this podcast reminding yeah. our millennial and boomer friends that we do exist. We do. So, uh, Kevin, uh, this uh, SQL injection vulnerability has kind of been making the rounds. I've seen yeah, it all I, over social media. I think you um, picked this story with three of my favorite topics. Uh, vulnerability that shouldn't exist anymore. SQL injection. Yep. Uh, TSA, who <laughs> Which I shouldn't exist love anymore. and should not exist anymore, <laughs> and what appears to be two people who do security research. Shouldn't exist anymore? No, nope, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I, I am no, very no, no. curious about that aspect of this because my read of it is here are two people who are security researchers, bug bounty people, and, and, and again, I've said this a million times, I yeah. think bug bounties have their place. I think... I, right. I've played around with, oh, stuff, of course, you know, but I'm bothered by the implication that they, the, the, the main article about this is a guy that does a whole bunch of stuff with, you know, tracking of, of airlines and stuff like that. And the implication in the article is they got interested in the known crew member access and thought, hmm, I wonder what we could do there and found a random vendor that runs a website for it. Mm -hmm. and then hacked it. I can't find a publicly disclosed bug bounty program for that website, mm -hmm. nor can I find anything in their article that implies. Right. Even though uh, if you look at, you know, the, the root of that website, um, the, the person who wrote it links out to hacker one as a place that they do a bunch of stuff with. And, and I'm always curious again, I'm not, complaining to this, this person, I'm asking, with the sheer amount of bug bounty programs you have access to, what made you think to yourself, if I'm right, there is no bug bounty program for this site, what made mm. you think to yourself, instead of using all these ones that are legitimate, I'm going to randomly pick on a site, which in their own words, they did not want to notify about the vulnerability because it was run by a single guy and they didn't mm. want to scare him. Well, probably because of how serious the issue is, too, I, right? See, mm -hmm. I disagree with that. No? Okay. I One, I, I don't know that I agree that this issue is as serious as they're portraying. And I, and I say that only because, and I'm not agreeing that DHS is right, that there was no threat. I think this was bad. But I think that, I don't know, I, I feel like this was, and, and here's where I'm going to piss off somebody or lots of people. <laughs> I feel like this was a, where can we make the biggest bang for the buck? Where can we get the most attention? Where can we get the most celebrity? Do you think this is stunt hacking? Mm. Mm. I don't know if it crosses oh. to that, but okay. I'll go with it. But, I, but that's why I say it. So I, I mean, would, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just... not accusing them of doing that. I'm asking, what made you go? One, is my understanding correct that there is no bug bounty program? And if there is no bug bounty program, what made you think to yourself it was okay to go and beat up on a... Because let's think about this. They found a SQL injection fault. That's horrible. This is atrocious. The fact that this exists is massively bad. And DHS's handling mm -hmm. of it, if they are correct in what they wrote, 
yeah. is atrocious and somebody oh, needs totally. to be punched in the throat uh, at DHS. <laughs> so here's what we did. We found a vulnerability in a site that was written by a single guy. And then we didn't tell him. We told his only customer. Yeah, that's mean. That's extortion. That's you hurt this person's livelihood with no warning to the person. I think that's unethical. Hmm. I'm okay with them finding the flaw. I think it's awesome they found the flaw. I'm okay with them reporting the flaw. I think it's awesome they reported the flaw. Report it to the person who could fix it. Yeah. You want to also report it to DHS? That's great. Do you want to also report it to TSA? Hmm. They're useless, but go for it. But the fact that they actually say in their article, one guy wrote the site and we didn't want to scare him. No, you didn't want to bother him because you wanted That's to- interesting. Yeah, that's I'm, an interesting that's take on That's the part this. I'm bothered by. Yeah. I mean, this because this guy sitting yeah. in his office, look, he wrote bad code. He wrote a ridiculous vulnerability. And if yeah. the Flycast guy is listening, I doubt it. Call me. I've got training. I'll put you in for free so you can learn some of this stuff. No issue. But you know what happened, right? He's sitting in his office and he gets an email from the vendor, procurement, mm -hmm. onboarding, security person at, at DHS that said, we've removed you from the vendor list because your site has a vulnerability. Did he get a chance to fix it? No. Did he get notification he had a problem? No. Did these two people who thought they could make a name for themselves or have a name and just want to build on it, did they screw this guy over for fame? Yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And that pisses me off. I, 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 that's an interesting take. I mean, it's a different take than what I see other people talking about in the industry with, the, I mean, from the industry and in, about this situation. And it's more about the vulnerability and people are shocked that you could actually put a single quote or one equals one. I would argue that in a anybody website. shocked that you can put a single quote in websites today and still find SQL injection aren't actually web app pen testers because that's, we find SQL injection not all the time. It is. But not this easy. I mean, no, let's be. We absolutely find flaws this easily. We mm -hmm. just found one, what, a month ago we were talking on a podcast about that week we found a vulnerability in a login okay. page with a single quote. I Don't get me wrong. I think it's atrocious. I think that if yeah. your application is that vulnerable. Right, right. That's horrible. Like, I am in yeah. no way downplaying. But I will absolutely say that anybody who claims that they are an active web pen tester in 2024 and their surprise SQL injection still exists, aren't actually testing applications. That's true, because it does exist. Of course That's a good it does. Point. Right? Yeah. We find it all the time. Not as often yep. as others. Say. Like, I'm, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. we definitely found it way more often in 2010 than we do oh, in of 2024. Course. Yeah, yeah. But no, we find this all the time. Yeah. And I'll bet you, I haven't looked, but I'll bet you the Flycast website, if it really is run by one dude, was probably written in... Oh, for a long time ago. And, it probably was right. Yeah, I mean and, that's yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's true. Yeah, we find it. I I mean, I went. I I actually took a Jason Haddock's bug bounty program class, mm -hmm. which I want to be very clear. Everybody knows if you've listened to this podcast before that I am madly in love with Jason Haddock's. I would have his. <laughs> I would have his babies if he let me. The dude is amazing and, and incredible. And I took the course. And and I also want to say, just for the record, I paid full price for it. Like I nice. paid for the course. I yeah. want to support Jason. Everybody else should take the course. Um, it's great. Uh, amazing course. I've learned a bunch from it. And I was going somewhere with that. Yeah. And you lost it. I did. Because <laughs> oh. you're in love with Jason. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The way he runs this course, and this is actually kind of cool. They come up with a target. It's a bug yeah. bounty program. So they go into one of the bug bounty programs and they pick a very wide open bug bounty. Like, Anything after this organization is in scope, right? Well, you know, here's the scope guidelines, whatever. And then the class is run. And then for 30 or 60 days afterwards, they actually run the bug bounty program, which is, is really neat. And uh, they found SQL injection in the class I was in. Wow. Right. Like, so yeah. as recently as this year, not me, not my company, other people are finding SQL injection. In. So yeah, this is not a new vulnerability. This is not a surprising vulnerability especially not in an application that was awarded to the lowest bidder run by an organization that is useless anyways, TSA. And uh, yeah, none of this is a surprise. Well, there you have it, folks. A very different uh, take. 
on this issue. Yeah. So but that's great. I, I love I love the opinion and can't say you're not wrong. So, <laughs> you can't say I'm not I mean, wrong. I can't argue. You also I, can't I, say I, I am right. I, I know. I, this, but I, I can't argue with you. So yeah. I, I okay. and I don't know that I'm. I, I will. I want to be very clear. I I'm not expressing everything about this. I just that is yeah, the yeah. part that really struck out to me when I read this yeah. article. Are you still relying on outdated managed file transfer tools? In today's world, the security of your sensitive data is more critical than ever. Introducing KiteWorks, the most secure and modern managed file transfer platform available. KiteWorks is audited yearly and continuously monitored by certified third-party assessors with an ongoing bounty program, regular penetration testing, and one-click appliance updates KiteWorks minimizes vulnerabilities like no other. Many traditional MFT solutions can't compare to the level of security and functionality KiteWorks provides. But that's not all. KiteWorks offers a world-class secure file sharing and email platform. Easily send automated or ad hoc files through fully integrated shared folders and email. Administrators can manage policies in a unified console and create custom integrations with their comprehensive REST API. Step into the future of secure managed file transfer with KiteWorks. Visit KiteWorks.com to get started. That's KiteWorks.com to get started today. So moving on, let's talk about Bitcoin ATM scams. I don't know anybody who could have predicted that Bitcoin ATMs would be used to scam old people. Maybe. Or that anybody. Bitcoin would be used to scam people. I yeah, mean, <laughs> never, never. I By the way, that's... I do want to say for the record, Craig Wright is not the inventor of Bitcoin. He's a lying plagiarizer. That way. Oh. <laughs> okay. Now that that's out there. <laughs> that I say it as often as I can. Anytime yes. Bitcoin okay. comes up, All Craig right. Wright is Fair a enough. piece of shit and did not invent okay. Bitcoin. Okay. So, All right. <laughs> and um, he can sue me if he wants. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. No problem. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> <laughs> not the opinion of the Shared Security Podcast. No, but the no, of Kevin. definitely not. <laughs> this is just Kevin's personal opinion. But anyway, so over $110 million has been lost um, and it's increasing yeah. with these Bitcoin scams. So how, they, how it works is es essentially scammers, they impersonate government officials, businesses, tech supports, you know, the, the typical ruse and create urgency, all those things. And they're convincing victims to deposit their cash into these Bitcoin ATMs, which essentially transfer funds to crypto wallets, unbeknownst to the victim, because the victims are just not educated on what Bitcoin is, what a Bitcoin ATM is, and people f are falling for it, especially older people uh, who this particular scam is targeting, yeah. just like we see with other scams and Honestly, I mean, Kevin, you and I have talked about this. So like these are the, in my opinion, some of the worst of the worst yeah. scammers out there to, to take advantage of older yep. and elderly people is, uh, is I think the only people terrible. that are worse are the ransomware operators that ransomware hospitals. That too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Two groups of people that I will hate with an undying right. passion. I, I do want to make it clear, and I know that you explain this, but I want to make it very, very clear to people, because I'm seeing way too many people talking about this that are treating it as if it's a Bitcoin scam. Like, yeah, it's Bitcoin not. is no. not the scam. Nope. The scam is just they're using Bitcoin That's right. to get the cash, right? And, and, and it, yeah. I like, I, I've watched too many, I've read too many articles that fixate on the idea, well, these Bitcoin ATMs are dangerous. These Bitcoin ATMs are no more dangerous yep. than the Apple gift cards sold at Publix, right? Like, I, that's right. It's another yeah. way to get cash. Yes. Is it harder to track? Is it hard? Yes. But Bitcoin itself is not the issue. But yeah, yeah this is bad. And, and I, I think that the same advice that we've given for all these other ones is, is the same thing, right? The IRS is not going to ask you for Bitcoin. The sheriff's office is not going to warn you about your impending arrest and then offer you an out by you going somewhere and buying gift cards or Bitcoin or anything else like that. And, and bluntly, in, in some of the things I've read, I think one of, the, one of the reasons the Bitcoin ATM works a little bit better is one, Bitcoin is a currency at some level, 
right? And it's understood as a currency at some level. And I say at some level because I'm, I, I don't think it quite qualifies to, you know, whatever. But um, I'm not an economist. I barely understand compounding no, interest. Definitely not. But uh, we have been pushing the message that the government isn't going to ask for an Apple gift card. And even if we don't push that message, there is a yeah. level of, why am I buying Outback gift cards to pay the sheriff's office? Right. I mean, Dunkin' Donuts gift cards totally understand for the sheriff's yeah. office. Nothing. <laughs> right. But, uh, but Bitcoin, I think one of the, I think one of the things is so many of the relatively younger people, you and I and, and younger are excited about cryptocurrency are talking about cryptocurrency. So when grandpa or grandma hears, Hey, go get Bitcoin. That's a natural progression of, yeah, the government may be using that now. And, and, you know, we, we treat this yeah. as, as if these people are older, so they don't understand technology. And so they're falling for this. And that's really not what's happening. It, it, it's, they're falling for it because it's a con and yep, a scam. Exactly. And right. But I think, I think that's actually one of the things that's making this easier for the attackers, the scammers to pull off is that so many people have really legitimized Bitcoin. And I'm not saying that's wrong to do. I'm, I'm just saying that, that that legitimization of Bitcoin has made it more likely that the IRS or the sheriff's office would trade it. Yeah, and it's being yeah. talked about yeah. in the news. It's exactly. being talked about, you know, with this election coming up. I mean, it's it's on people's minds right. and, you know, it's obviously being touted as another form of currency. So why would it not sound legitimate exactly. to people? And yeah. so I think we just need to keep pushing the same model, that, that, except not focusing on the delivery mechanism of the money, but focusing on the, the government isn't calling you this way. Yeah, the <laughs> really, that, that, That's right. This doesn't work this way. And, and if they do yeah. call you, say to them, you'll call them back and then right. hang up yep. and call the actual office, right? Like if it's the IRS, go to irs.gov and look at the customer support phone number and call that number, not the number the person gave you. Yeah. Um, like do the normal, it, 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 what I've always said to people, and I think I've said it on this show, think about what you would do if somebody walked up to you. If I knocked on your front door and said, hi, I'm the IRS, give me Bitcoin. What would you do to me in, on your doorstep? You would probably ask me for identification. You would, right? Like you would, all of this other stuff that you would do, think about that when you get that email or that SMS or that phone call. Well, how do you verify this? Well, the way you verify yeah. it is by a third party, third but out of band source. So don't verify it on the phone. Go to the website. Yeah. And don't click the link they give you. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Do not do that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The other piece of advice I give people, which is common in all of these scams, is they are pushing you to make quick financial decisions. Urgency. Like, don't talk to your friends. Don't talk to your family. You, this is urgent. There's a sense of urgency. And if you could pick up on that early, that is almost 100% guarantees that this is a scam. <laughs> if you're being pushed because there's an urgent situation, you know, and, and that's a trick. That's a con trick, right? To get you to make a decision quickly because you're under pressure. All right. Awesome. Well, I think that's all we got time for today, Kevin. So thanks for listening, everyone. And until next time, stay safe, stay secure, and stay private. Thanks for watching or listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts, follow us on X at Shared Sec, and help support the podcast by joining our Patreon to get ad-free episodes, bonus content, and many more exclusive supporter-only benefits. Visit sharedsecurity.net slash supporter for more details.